Good morning, and um, let me welcome you this morning for um, a very welcome opportunity to hear from uh, the Ukrainian ambassador to Washington. Um, we were very lucky to um, have persuaded him to speak here this morning because we knew that this would be a very important time that Ukraine has been at a crossroads in uh, taking the next step towards not only um, its internal political and economic development, but, but in the development of its foreign policy and its relationship with the United States. And uh, before everyone goes off on vacation for the summer, it seems like a good moment to think about where we are and have the opportunity to talk with amongst ourselves, but also with someone who is so knowledgeable and, and has been already so influential on the issues of U.S.-Ukrainian relations. Um, my name is Celeste Hollander. I'm the director of the Russia and Eurasia program. My job here is to welcome you and to introduce Ambassador Stephen Piper. Um, Ambassador Piper is a senior advisor with CSIS, working primarily on issues relating to Ukraine, but also relating to U.S.-Russia relations and regional security in the um, Central and Eastern European region as it impacts U.S. relations and interests with those important countries. Before I uh, turn the podium over to Ambassador Piper, though, I want to acknowledge, I want to point out that um, U.S.-Ukrainian uh, partnership is important in many ways and in no less way because now that the U.S. national team is out of the World Cup, um, us Americans who are watching, <laughs> watching the World Cup needed a team to root for, so I thought it was important to have not only the official flag, but a very important flag to symbolize that partnership. So in that spirit, I'll turn the podium over to Steve Piper. So thanks very much. Uh, I'm not sure how to uh, follow that introduction, uh, but uh, let me just briefly introduce uh, the ambassador. We are very pleased to have him with us today. Uh, he's had a uh, very distinguished diplomatic career. He served at the Ukrainian embassy in Brussels for five years as counselor, uh, and that was the uh, Ukrainian mission to all the Benelux countries. He then came back uh, to uh, Kyiv, definitely on a fast track. He headed up the European Union Integration Department then moved quickly to become Deputy Foreign Minister, and in January arrived here in Washington uh, as Ukraine's ambassador to the United States. And I think uh, we could say he's gotten off to an extremely fast and effective start. If you look at a number of the big issues in U.S.-Ukraine relations, uh, let's see, his first month here, Ukraine uh, was granted market economy status. His second month here, uh, they completed the U.S.-Ukraine WTO bilateral protocol, which we've been working on for four or five years. And uh, I think his third month here, Ukraine was graduated by Congress from Jackson Bannock. Uh, so people have been working on it for six years. So uh, definitely, he, this is a man who, when they are in Kyiv, writing up his evaluation for six months, has a number of things that are going to definitely be in the uh, plus uh, column. <coughs> He's also, I think, though, a fairly good predictor of Ukrainian events. <coughs> We've been talking about doing this talk here at CS, CSIS for, I guess, about two and a half or three months now. And we both agreed that it would be better to have this after there was either a government in place or at least a coalition name, because that would allow him to frame his remarks, uh, anticipating that there might be some different uh, directions if there were an orange coalition as opposed to an orange-blue coalition. And as we tried to sort this out uh, about a month and a half ago, uh, he suggested June 29 would be a date that would work, and his predictions proved accurate that he now has a coalition in place, uh, we hope. And uh, so uh, we're looking very much forward to his comments, both about what's going on in Ukraine and also about uh, developments in Ukraine's external relations. Uh, the comments today are on the record. Uh, following his prepared remarks, uh, the ambassador has kindly agreed to take questions. Uh, so we're looking very much to hear him. And uh, please join me in welcoming, please join me in welcoming Ambassador Shamsher. <laughs> Madam Ambassador, actually, thank you very much for this introduction, although I always say that after generous introduction, you feel a bit uh, under stress because you have to live up to the expectations. So, uh, first of all, I would like to say that I'm extremely pleased to be here at the CSIS, uh, definitely. Uh, we have been planning it for uh, some time, and I was really happy that uh, the timing was well, practically. Right, and I was uh, also, I'm quite happy that 
although uh, I refrained from comments on uh, the possible composition of the coalition due to the official restraints. Uh, I made some personal predictions in public, and they were speaking about the orange color, and there's practically no doubt that it would be like that. And well, I would say in my personal capacity, I feel very much satisfied. Uh, as I said, uh, I have been on uh, the speaker circuit for quite some time due to the continued interest in developments in my country uh, before election, during election, after election. And of course, there's a positive side about that, but there is, uh, or maybe there are some challenges. Uh, one of them is that you risk to be boring, at least to yourself, uh, as you are repetitive, more or less, uh, speaking about the same things. So as soon as I see some familiar faces in the audience, uh, I will try not to be too repetitive. So uh, identifying maybe some uh, basic things and leaving uh, some uh, space, uh, maybe bigger space for Q and A's. Understandably, I will try to concentrate on the positive side of the developments uh, because I'm quite sure you will point out the problematic issues and questions. Uh, uh, maybe also uh, as the second small introduction, uh, uh, presumably everyone is informed about the developments in Ukraine. So we have a coalition agreement, uh, we have a decision in principle on the Prime Minister, practically on uh, the Speaker, on uh, the distribution of uh, major committees and things like that. Uh, now the process is a bit stalled uh, due to developments in the Parliament. But I would like to stress that in my perception, it wouldn't and it's not going to change my overall um, appreciation of the situation. The only thing which is to be underscored in the, this regard is definitely that the developments during the last two days uh, proves the necessity uh, of the uh, responsible behavior by all political forces and it definitely applies to the opposition if you want uh, to bring a really constructive relationship between all political uh, actors. So uh, I think it would be appropriate if I start my remarks with uh, maybe some words about the significance of the Orange Revolution and uh, uh, I would limit myself to a couple of uh, relevant points. So first of all, of course, it was a turning point in Ukraine's contemporary history, history after 1991. So uh, important to note is that the uh, events of 2000, late 2004, 2000, early 2005, they marked a popular choice in favor of democracy, in favor of the acceleration of the process of economic reform, and in favor of building a modern dynamic society. So uh, that was in a way a beginning of a new stage in Ukrainian development. So it marked the start of the ultimate departure from the post-Soviet past, uh, the departure which was terminated in my perception in, uh, by the election of 2006. It's also important to state uh, that the significance or relevance of developments in Ukraine in 2004, but also the subsequent developments in 2005, elections of 2006, it definitely transcends the uh, domestic dimension and have a wider regional and not only regional, regional uh, political bearing. Uh, when we assess uh, the uh, current situation, uh, we cannot but pose the question which is being posed quite often, what, what we make of the year passed after uh, um, uh, 2004, so 2006, early uh, 2005 uh, and early 2006. So as it's formulated in the topic of today's uh, discussion, 18 years after the Orange Revolution. Uh, what, was, uh, what kind of the year was that? So I argued continuous, and here I also uh, presume I was quite consistent saying that uh, the claim that it was the year of lost opportunities definitely is not correct. So it was the year, if I try to summarize it, it was the year of learning, learning of truly uh, democratic governance. Uh, it was difficult year, sometimes grueling one, 
uh, year of uh, mistakes. Some of the mistakes were definitely avoidable and were painful. But at the same time, this year was absolutely necessary for breaking the ground for the next stage uh, of Ukraine's uh, development, for the next stage of reform process. Uh, that was uh, also the year when we got the confirmation, and it was consummated again in election, that the country has changed and changed in a very uh, profound way. Uh, our president, in his article in New York, uh, uh, I'm sorry, in the Wall Street Journal, uh, uh, well, has given a very correct appraisal of the significance of this year and of the election. Uh, that was the termination of the post stage of development of Ukraine. Of course, our list of things to do is very impressive. It's a very challenging task, but they will be decided in a, as I said, radically new political and, to a very great extent, economic and social environment. I've spoken a couple of times about the election. Uh, definitely, I would like maybe to mention a couple of things which are relevant for our today's discussion. So, first of all, the character of the election has now been recognized by everyone as just, democratic, transparent, and that was not something what uh, was uh, quite evident from the start, but it was the result of the changes taking place in the society, but also uh, uh, due to the fulfillment of the commitment taken by uh, the president, by the new leadership of Ukraine. And it was very important that the whole process was democratic, not only uh, the process on uh, voting on the election day. Uh, secondly, what was also surprising to many uh, observers, but was very important, that turnout was very respectable, around 70%, which showed that the uh, thesis about disillusionment, uh, not willingness of the Ukrainians to be further engaged in the process of change, doesn't hold water. Thirdly, and uh, what is not often mentioned, but I think it should be mentioned, that uh, the election marked a very severe blow to the communist ideology, cutting the Communist Party of Ukraine to its real size in terms of influence on the societal process. And I would dare say in my personal capacity, I also hope that the results of the vote would somehow precipitate or encourage the changes uh, including ideological changes in the uh, socialist uh, uh, movement in Ukraine. And uh, for me, uh, it's also very impo important to give the right uh, appreciation of the results of the election. In my perception, the uh, verdict at the polling stations was that people want not less reform, but they would like to see continuation of reform, to see them more consistent, more forward-looking. So, uh, not again, as I said, not to bore you too much about things which have been said already. I would just uh, maybe uh, uh, also draw your attention to a couple of things related to the record of the new leadership in some areas which are sometimes neglected. So, it's quite known, it's not contested, the major breakthroughs were made in uh, developing a law defining of democratic institutions, in uh, ensuring maybe for the first time freedom of expression and the media. Uh, it also should be noted, what is not always mentioned, is that we also have seen the radical changes in political process. For the first time, the power was accountable before the population in a real way, and it had to respond to public opinion, to criticism, and it was open for criticism, for control, uh, and the freedom of political choice was ensured. The third, uh, uh, third thing, which is also neglected, as people try to concentrate mostly on the shortcomings, was that in spite of all maybe deficiencies, they managed to shatter the system of oligarchic control over the economy. Uh, we also start uh, dismantling uh, the most notorious shadow schemes in economy. We also uh, made very important steps in uh, fighting uh, corruption, which has been endemic until 2005. Uh, what is also not very often mentioned, uh, the government can also claim a number of uh, successes in the process of restructuring of economy and making uh, it more transparent, if you wish, more healthy. 
So I would like to mention that the state budget revenues in 2005 increased by over 50 percent. And they expected to double by the end of 2006. So that is the unprecedented development in Ukraine's economy. And it's one of the best proofs of uh, this economy coming gradually out of the shadow. Very important thing uh, was um, made in uh, stepping up efforts of um, uh, fighting smuggling, which was also very widespread. Uh, and uh, uh, the customs revenues uh, in 2005 increased by 80%, which, is was, which is also quite telling. Although the figures of uh, the uh, economic development are not that impressive, but it should be noted that for the first time they were, maybe in the recent years, they were made on a healthy, robust basis. It's also important that inflation was contained at 10%, two point lower than in 2004. A significant increase was achieved in the central bank international reserves, although, of course, the figures are not impressive compared to reserves in the United States or in Russia, other countries. We also managed to reduce the budget deficit from 3.4 to 1.8% in 2005. And also, uh, it was ensured the gr uh, growth of uh, the GDP per capita was ensured as well. It's also well known that the government fulfilled the promise of improving uh, living conditions. So the wa pages, wages and pensions were increased um, uh, in a way that real income uh, grew by 20% and social benefits by over 30%. But here I would like to say that one of the challenges uh, which uh, uh, the government the government, previous government and the new government will be confronted with, of course, will be to find the, the correct balance between the understanding necessity and political necessity to improve living conditions and to uh, fulfill long-term macroeconomic goals. Uh, the important thing, which is not often mentioned, is that some steps were taken to deregulate um, the, the economic procedures. Uh, it was mentioned that 10,000s of obsolete regulations were already cancelled. Uh, the procedures uh, of uh, starting business, of business registration, uh, allotment of non-agricultural land plots for industrial developments uh, have been started as well, and we moved in the direction of creating ideally the system, as we say, one window uh, procedures service for opening business or one stop, as we say, in the United States. And finally, uh, maybe for the first time in, since 1995, they managed uh, to pursue the coherent foreign policy with a very strong emphasis upon human rights, which was not the fact before. Well, um, and now I think uh, we can basically uh, uh, move uh, to the current situation, but before that I would like just to be objective to say that apart from creating momentum, apart from having positive bearing on the processes in Ukraine, of course, elections highlighted some issues which are to be addressed and addressed on a very urgent basis, one of them being the persistence of regional differences, not simply in voter orientation, not only economically, but also, I would say, in social organization. And these are issues which are extremely important. And one of the challenges for the development of the Ukrainian political system is, of course, to uh, form or create the party which would be able to formulate the program and the message which would have outreach transcending the regional uh, lines, the boundaries of the regions and uh, the, the current voters' preferences. So uh, the issue of the uh, coalition building. Of course, everyone, both the friends and maybe critics of Ukraine, have been watching this process with certain impatience. There was a lot of criticism. But I would like, actually, to uh, say a couple of words uh, which should be said uh, to set the rock, uh, record uh, straight. So definitely it was, and it's still, extremely difficult, challenging, sometimes painful process. But that's the process and the character of the process, something what everyone has expected, actually, because uh, no one expected uh, that uh, it would be an easy task. 
especially with a view that the government and the coalition is being formed under the new constitutional rules with a new distribution of power and one of the major challenges just maybe moving a bit ahead would be in the post-election, post-government formation process to uh, um, uh, to ensure the necessary fine-tuning, uh, the necessary balance of power and interaction between uh, different branches of power. So, firstly, it was expected, and uh, but it was done absolutely as big as in a democratic uh, way, within democratic procedures, and for the time being, all the constitutional deadlines were respected. So, secondly, uh, I mentioned the new rules of political engagement, which takes time uh, to be accustomed to and uh, to be used efficiently. Uh, thirdly, what is important to mention is, of course, the whole process has been involving a significant amount of horse trading. But it's horse trading more or less of the type you have in all uh, uh, countries. You have in uh, within especially uh, when you have a uh, coalition government, which is quite uh, characteristic of the European political process. But what is important is that the process was not limited to horse trading, and maybe for the first time, the parties uh, who are trying to form the coalition, who have actually formed the coalition, were engaged in a serious discussion on the basic program principles. And this discussion, although definitely there were limits to that due to the character of negotiations. Actually, I would say it was crazy public because many issues have been very, uh, uh, very actively discussed in the society and definitely had impact on the decisions uh, taken uh, uh, by negotiators. Uh, finally, it's also important that the program, as we see it uh, now, uh, it's actually it's a compromise. Some parts might have been better but sometimes the parts might have been worse in the sense that it was the product of compromise between the democratic parties and on the whole the program as we see it now is definitely gives a very uh, i would say promising uh, blueprint for uh, further development of the ukrainian society i would like also to mention that in the embassy we made the translation of the basic uh, lines of basic provisions of uh, uh, the uh, coalition program, and uh, if I'm not mistaken, have already put it on the website. So if you're interested, you can uh, uh, have some idea how it looks uh, presently. Uh, what is also um, uh, important uh, to mention that at the end, as I said before, we have the coalition of the uh, democratic. Uh, uh, forces. Of course, uh, the best proof um, of uh, the efficiency of the process will be in the stability of the government. Uh, definitely, we shall see uh, these uh, things in the near future, future. But um, in my personal capacity, I would say that I would be, I would say, quite optimistic about that because many things, very important, very difficult things, have been already uh, discussed. Uh, concerning uh, the program and also concerning the interaction between uh, the different parties of uh, uh, the agreement and I hope that it augurs well for the stability of the government in future. Uh, as far as the program is concerned, I'm not going uh, to go into detail. Maybe I will highlight a couple of uh, priorities for the government. If you're interested, I will try to have the program with me. I will be ready to elaborate on uh, the sum of the program provisions. But for me, it's quite clear that there are some priorities which would be at the top of the list of the government. Definitely the issue of energy. Uh, the issue uh, of uh, reforming the energy sector in Ukraine and also to develop the agreements uh, concerning uh, supply of gas and oil to Ukraine, which would be uh, both uh, efficient and uh, transparent. The issue of fighting corruption. Recently, we signed um, the so-called threshold program uh, with uh, the uh, uh, Millennium Challenge Corporation. It's one of the signs of the seriousness of uh, the intentions of uh, the new leadership. Uh, President uh, is uh, preparing his new program concerning fighting uh, corruption, which will be promulgated as far as I understand, as soon as the government is formed. So this issue is being taken very seriously. 
So there are issues which are related to this problem. Definitely, that is the need to complete judicial reform to ensure the independence and efficiency of the judiciary, to uh, finish, uh, to complete tax reform. All those things definitely are very important to creating a propitious business climate. To improve it, to improve uh, stability, uh, uh, business confidence, so that we it have a positive bearing both internally but also especially on attracting foreign investment. I mentioned already the regulation program is quite explicit as far as the continuation of the regulation is concerned. Definitely it will be helped by uh, the WTO accession and actually it was one of the points where there was heated discussion how it would be done because of the position of the socialists. It's very good that we have this commitment and uh, it's mentioned in a couple of uh, uh, provisions and it also augurs quite well for the final result. Uh, the social policy issues are also being addressed. It, it concerns uh, uh, reform of education, reform of health, improve, uh, of health system, improving uh, living standards, but also it's very important, I know that in the program when I read it quite attentively, uh, that uh, maybe for the first time we have a very, I would say, bold statement where it said that the coalition will, would seek uh, cancellation or abolition, uh, rescinding of the laws which have been already uh, passed but which has populist uh, nature and are not substantiated, are not insured by the budget revenues. For me it's a very important development. So final foreign policy. Uh, apart from program, we have uh, the statement of the foreign minister uh, and everything shows that the foreign policy is not going to be changed. We have uh, the uh, commitment uh, to uh, pursue the course of uh, Euro, uh, European integration. Uh, energy is also uh, figures uh, quite importantly on the uh, foreign policy related issues. And one of the issues which was contested uh, because of the position of the socialists, that is uh, the clause on eventual NATO membership. It's one of the clauses which I would prefer to be formulated maybe more strongly, but that's again a result of the compromise. But the most important is uh, that we have confirmation of the course towards NATO membership, although there is a mention of referendum, but it definitely only also reflects the necessity uh, of uh, step up in uh, of stepping up our work in this direction, and it's also mentioned specifically in the foreign uh, policy segment of uh, the program. So everything in the program shows that we will see the continuation of the coherent policy aimed at uh, European and eventual Euro-Atlantic integration. So uh, finally, what I would like to mention, maybe before uh, moving to Q and A's is that, and referring to the um, topic of today's uh, roundtable, uh, is that, uh, well, definitely the year that passed, year and a half that passed, showed that uh, legacy, but also the lessons of the democratic revolution and the period after revolution definitely are extremely relevant for Ukraine. So, um, it also teaches us a very important lesson uh, that revolution, especially revolutions in modern times, they do not create immediate change. Rather, they create opportunities for change. And it's definitely, it, they foment change. And it's definitely up to the politicians, but not only for the politicians, up also uh, to, to the general public, to the citizens, to take full advantage of uh, these opportunities. Uh, for change. It's also important that democratic principles, which were voiced uh, at Maidan, the major square of Ukraine, uh, voiced uh, during discourse uh, uh, at the revolution period, they haven't uh, disappeared. They are still with us. Uh, they have become the very solid uh, present part of our societal life. And uh, I would say they have uh, developed in being reference points for our political leaders. It's also interesting that not only the new leadership uh, sometimes, well, it refers always to the ideals of uh, Maidan, but also opposition quite often when it wants to pursue some goals refers to the promises and the principles of Maidan, which in my opinion is a positive development. So we have also learned our painful lessons 
uh, we are aware now more than before about uh, all the challenges, and I have that we have a will to succeed. So I would finish on the light uh, note. Actually, I prepared that before this wonderful uh, garment, but it shows that we are also thinking in the same direction, and definitely uh, many uh, hopes are centered upon uh, the um, uh, tomorrow's uh, match. Uh, but I would like, uh, well, not not trying to predict here. I would be more cautious. Uh, but still, I would rather allude to the previous development of our our team's progress in uh, this World Championships. So at first, we had very high expectations because they performed very well at the preparatory phase. Then we had, I would say, uh, in this case, it was resounding defeat, but definitely, definitely there was a painful exercise. Nevertheless, uh, we proved again to become the kid. Uh, Ukraine rebound. Uh, uh, our team persevered, and eventually we won against all the odds. All the odds. So I hope that it would be a good sort of scenario for Ukraine's development in the years to come. Thank you. Okay, I'd like to open the uh, floor now for questions. I, I would ask if you could just uh, briefly though, uh, state your name and uh, affiliation, and uh, also wait for the microphones which we have uh, coming around. Actually, it's one of the questions which is being uh, often asked. Uh, well, I would say that um, uh, the program, as I mentioned, showed both continuity but also uh, the um, uh, awareness of the seriousness of the situation. So what uh, I would say is that, uh, that finally, for the first time, we have funding for the programs uh, uh, related to uh, public information about uh, the goals of uh, the NATO integration policy. Secondly, uh, and I had a chance to chat with our first deputy minister of uh, defense, who is on the visit here, uh, uh, they have uh, not simply taken serious discussion, but outlined uh, the possible uh, steps to be taken to make this campaign not only more, I would say, expensive in terms of being it a wide campaign, but uh, to make it also more efficient. And now we are considering the best uh, uh, maybe forms and methods of this work, as it should be understand that we cannot work as uh, the previous government worked when they were able more or less, well, I would say more rather than less, to direct the activities of the media. And you remember those famous techniques, so definitely we cannot resort to this. And it's actually impossible now to follow these practices. So we also should uh, work with the media to uh, develop the best means to uh, uh, actually have this kind of uh, uh, campaign. What is uh, very important, uh, I think, uh, apart from working with the learned, so to say, part of the population, professionals, people like that, it's very um, uh, important to have the outreach to the wider population. And now it's being considered how we do it in the most efficient, both efficient way in the most terms, so in the most efficient way. And definitely uh, what we shall see is more communication with uh, the public at the grassroots level, what I mentioned uh, a couple of occasions, uh, town hall type meetings uh, as we have here. So uh, uh, now we have finally financing. Uh, we have political will, and I think that 
as soon as the government for, uh, formed the vision, we'll have uh, some practical steps uh, taken, uh, not in distant, but in the immediate future, I presume as soon as in autumn. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, thank you for the presentation. My name is Neil Duran. I'm with TD International. Uh, you briefly mentioned uh, energy reform in your presentation. I was wondering if you would comment perhaps on um, government policy to increase domestic production of oil and gas, considering the fact that the country's oil and gas reserve to production ratio is very high. Thank you. Uh, actually, it's a very good point, and it's one of the uh, most important provisions of uh, the uh, program which has already well uh, promulgated uh, c concerning the energy reform but definitely which will be uh, worked over further it's quite clear um, and uh, one of the points uh, where we would like to score one of the points we would like to score actually is uh, the uh, increase in the domestic uh, production of uh, oil and gas with the understanding of course there are some limits in this sense we will be uh, trying to use modern technology in order to uh, extract uh, residual oil and gas reserves in the well-known uh, oil and gas deposits, oil and gas fields. But I think the most promising is that we will be trying to develop new, especially gas fields in the Black Sea area. So the first time the process uh, has been bidding, uh, actually has been uh, finished. Uh, the uh, winner was uh, the American uh, uh, company, uh, uh, which was relatively uh, unknown, but uh, has uh, sound expertise, presented the best business plans. The, the whole process, the procedure was very transparent. It was the first uh, parcel. We are going to continue bidding for remaining parcels in uh, I would say it will be done uh, quite soon. So uh, the best hope uh, in my perception uh, rests with the deposits of uh, oil, but mostly gas in the Black Sea area. Thank you. Actually, if I, if I could continue with the, uh, the energy theme. Um, when uh, one goes back and looks at the existing contract with Russia on, on gas sales, there is some ambiguity in that contract. Uh, and, for example, one provision says that the prices over the five-year term of the contract cannot change with the agreement of both parties. And Ukrainian officials have said that the price of $95 per thousand cubic meters would continue to apply. Uh, another provision says that that price, however, is fixed only for the first six months. And we've seen comments by, by Russian officials in Gazprom that the price of gas to Ukraine is going up. Um, so, what do you think will happen on July 2nd, when the six-month point, uh, are, are we in, in for another gas war? Uh, well, actually, I think that uh, our Russian friends will be in a better position to answer, because uh, if anyone is going to raise prices, it will be them. So then uh, we just wait a bit. Um, I think it's for us, again, here I speak in my personal capacity, it's uh, extremely important to engage in dialogue with the Russian side as soon as possible. Uh, but also with other uh, important players in uh, this uh, field, uh, meaning that uh, we shall see, although I'm myself a bit doubtful about that timing, maybe it will happen a bit, uh, a bit uh, later, but uh, most important that uh, really, uh, and our wish was of course, of course to have the price sustained, or at least uh, being discussed uh, on uh, the basis of uh, understandable principles. <laughs> a couple of questions. One comment and then a question. On the energy uh, issue, I've been in Brussels a couple of times this year. One of the things that strikes me is that well, you've got the, you do have an effective capacity there working to the EU bureaucracy. A lot of government is, is in the impression within the EU bureaucracy and in the EU governments uh, that Ukraine's message about its position on the gas field and the Congress is not taken through. Now as a new government, I would just, uh, so I hope that there's somebody from a high level from the government can go to Brussels and, and the big capitals, Berlin, Paris, or Rome, and that's because and I think the uh, Ukrainians are kind of losing the propaganda battle in that case. But as far as I'm going, I'd like to follow up on Leo's point, the question of domestic production. 
Uh, a lot of us have the impression that the, the uh, slowness in domestic production over the last few years has been more of a focus or a problem of domestic structure of the, of the bureaucracy. And in fact, the oil and gas interests, particularly the gas interests within Ukraine, have tried to keep these, these sector locked up and have kept foreign companies out. So we all know cases here of, of foreign companies who would like to be involved in the Ukraine, especially American companies, but have, have been unable to kind of break through that barrier. And my question is, is that, do you think that, that the new government that does some of those uh, barriers will be broken down so that uh, it will be more friendly for foreign investors to get interest on it? Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Actually, uh, maybe I will combine the comment on the comment, but and also the answer. The fact is that if you look at the program, so you will see uh, uh, all the right things uh, on general energy issues and specific energy issues. And uh, concerning oil and gas matters, it speaks not only efficiency, efficiency, but it also speaks about transparency. It speaks about eliminate, em eliminating shadow intermediaries. So all the right things are here. It also relates to uh, the issues uh, concerning uh, the uh, well more general uh, principles of the energy policy. It's quite clear, and there is no secret, that one of the reasons uh, uh, there was so little movement on energy saving that Ukraine was, as President Bush said, U.S. is addicted to oil, Ukraine was addicted to cheap gas for too long. And it was, in my perception, was bad in the long-term perspective. It was bad for Ukraine's economy. So now uh, it's quite clear that we have very limited margin uh, of time for maneuver for restructuring our energy sector. And in this sense, what is being declared will be pursued quite seriously. Uh, the uh, domestic consumption, relaunching coal industry, development of a nuclear program, uh, energy saving, diversification of energy resources, and things like that. And if you speak as about the majority, the real majority of the uh, measures which are to be implemented, definitely they involve more than technologies and foreign capital. And in this sense, I'm quite sure American capital and foreign investment in general would be more than welcome. So everything would be done to attract foreign investment in this field. And very promising uh, uh, step, which I mentioned, is really the bidding for a Black Sea, which was very transparent, although we were domestic bidders, but it, it went to the best prepared. Those who were a bit disappointed, big companies, okay, they should prepare better for bidding in the future. That's it's very simple. Uh, so in this sense, I would be quite uh, optimistic and positive, and again about speaking the uh, European dimension. So one of the points of the program, which is absolutely just, is the underscored importance of uh, implementation of the European Energy Charter. It gives very good framework for all players of uh, uh, the energy sector, and we think it's also important to engage all players, both producers transitors and consumers in a serious uh, dialogue, dialogue on energy issues so that we can ensure European energy security. And Ukraine wants to be a responsible and is a responsible player uh, in uh, this uh, equation. Thank you. Hi, my name is Kathy Campbell with the U.S. Civilian Research and Development Foundation. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. I wanted to ask you about um, your your thoughts on the prospects of getting the bilateral science and technology agreement signed between the U.S. and Ukraine. The old one expired, and both sides have been working for over a year now to get a new one. Um, it's important because the signal sends to both sides about the importance and the tremendous potential for combining. Um, uh, resources to address urgent, you know, energy or, or health issues, but also the agreement provides some useful uh, clarity and a framework for administrative, legal, and financial issues. Yeah, it's a simple question. Uh, as the embassy have been pushing and will be pushing for uh, the uh, termination of this process, uh, in the sense of bringing it to the logical. Uh, uh, completion so that you can sign this agreement. I presume as soon as we have uh, the cabinet in place, many things will start mo moving uh, much quicker. Um, I wanted to come back to the question of NATO uh, and the two part question. And the first one is could you explain to me why there is 
some of the missions in Asia among the Ukrainian population and so on, what happened in Crimea is being taken. And again, one of the questions is when you think of chances for a military action plan for Ukraine, I think it's really something. Uh, thank you. Actually, uh, I would say uh, there are maybe two parts to the first part. If you speak about Theodosia, I would still argue it's actually it shows the necessity for uh, better education campaign, information and, uh, and education campaign. But also it's a bit a case apart because it's much more complex than that. And it definitely there are too many factors that were involved over there I mean, in Theodosia. I will stop here, but I presume everyone understands what I mean. So, uh, uh, secondly, uh, as far as the whole thing is concerned, so I, I think that now we have a combination. So, first of all, uh, uh, definitely there is a lingering uh, impact of uh, the past. Cold War era, Cold War misconceptions, things like that. Especially among uh, the uh, older and also middle age uh, people like myself, for example, of course, we are not uniform, there are pro and the field that was still very much anchored in the past. So uh, thirdly, uh, the uh, fallout of 2004 especially, when uh, the very mean, obnoxious, but I would recognize efficient steps were taken uh, by uh, the, uh, by uh, the then, uh, the camp of the then uh, uh, prime minister. Uh, that's exactly what they managed to do to so ensure outreach and to stimulate uh, the worst uh, misconceptions, uh, um, uh, prejudices, still residual in the population, but especially in the area uh, which they were targeting. And fourthly, it's of course deficiencies of the information campaign, because it's really important, as I said, to formulate the coherent message and to uh, ensure that the uh, message comes through. And what is also not negligible, that although we have been speaking about that, well, practically since mid-90s, very little uh, has been done in practical, because uh, actually uh, the policy in this respect, uh, less with EU, but uh, also with EU, was more uh, at the level of declarations, not in practical work. And now as we uh, embarked the practical uh, path of joining NATO, I think it's also an, another incentive. Again, uh, I always made the point, we shouldn't uh, uh, downgrade the seriousness, but we shouldn't over-dramatize, because we have been seeing, seeing uh, fluctuations in public perception, and I think that's a task which can be effectively addressed, especially as among younger people, we have much greater acceptance, both for EU, which is in any case 60, 65 percent, but also for NATO. Well, Membership action plan, again, it's more, I don't know, if we have any representatives of the American government than to Ukraine. Uh, I said that uh, the, the program uh, gives, uh, I would say, a valid formulation. Uh, uh, President, uh, act, uh, the actual uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs confirmed continuation of the policy, and we are absolutely ready to uh, make sure to all, uh, to make everything necessary to convince our partners uh, that uh, the decision on MEP should be done in uh, 2008. So we still keep it at, as our target for this year. That's what I can tell you quite authoritatively. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Henry Hale. Yeah, Henry Hale, George Washington University. Um, I wonder how you would uh, describe Ukrainian policy towards uh, the Lukashenko regime in Belarus, and would you describe Ukrainian policy as being fully uh, in agreement with uh, United States policy regarding concrete measures that might need to be taken uh, regarding that regime? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I, actually, I would say that um, in dealing with uh, this challenge or this problem anyway. So uh, there are two aspects. So first of all, we should be uh, taking into account that in any case, uh, Belarus is a neighbor of Ukraine. So the country with which we have uh, a common border, I would say common related problems. Uh, secondly, it's, uh, we have, I would say, to a very great extent, a common history so ties between population, 
Uh, third, it's, it's an important uh, trade partner and economic partner for Ukraine. And fourthly, we have common problems related to Chernobyl. So in any case, we have to address those issues quite efficiently. That's one part of the problem. The other part of the problem is definitely we are not blind uh, to the processes which have been taken, uh, which have been developing in this country for quite some time uh, to make sure that we do not shy uh, of uh, criticism is that we joined all uh, statements made by the uh, EU within the framework of the OEC, where this issue has been discussed quite actively. Um, at the same time, uh, uh, we are uh, working uh, in close coordination with our American and EU partners to find the best ways to promote uh, democracy in this country. Uh, our uh, non-governmental organizations are working very actively with the Belarusian, uh, Belarusian uh, non-governmental organizations. So we still think that, um, uh, in a way, uh, we should really find the best way to deal with the situation. Uh, and uh, uh, we think that any steps, uh, punitive steps, uh, which are to be taken, are to be taken not in a way uh, to uh, be counterproductive and uh, make populations suffer. But again, we are coordinating and working very closely with all uh, democratic uh, countries and democratic actors in this process. Ukrainian service for your free for your liberty. Uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary of State David Kremer uh, last week um, talked about um, the United States government's uh, disappointment uh, with uh, the Ukraine's inability to organize uh, military joint military exercises in Crimea, and he specifically said he put the responsibility for that on the Ukrainian government, and he specifically said that uh, Ukraine's promises uh, were not matched uh, with actions in this particular uh, regard. How do you respond to the U.S. government official? How do you explain this failure on the part of the uh, U.S. Uh, Ukrainian authorities? And the second uh, related question, he also uh, mentioned uh, that the positive attitude uh, towards uh, Ukraine in NATO headquarters uh, over the last two months uh, dissipated uh, for a number of reasons. Um, uh, how do you, uh, as a Ukrainian official, uh, do, how do you think you will uh, be able to get uh, this positive atmosphere back in track? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Actually, uh, what hasn't been mentioned uh, by Steve is that actually I'm not a professional diplomat and I started as a researcher. And one of the good things about that is that I always verify my sources. And when, uh, after having read your account of David Kramer's uh, uh, statement, I actually had a chat with him. And definitely his interpretation was a bit different, just, just uh, for the starters. So secondly, if uh, I try to address uh, the issue in substance. So definitely Fedosia was disappointed for everyone. And it also was disappointment for Ukrainian authorities. Uh, it was, uh, as I said, answering the question, the situation was uh, very complicated for a variety of reasons. Definitely it was not spontaneous, it was very well planned. Unfortunately, we didn't manage to find adequate response, but it was a hard lesson, but it was very well, I would say, learned. And uh, the measures have been already uh, indicated by the uh, National Security Council. Uh, President spoke about that, and I presume that uh, in future we will take everything possible uh, to avoid uh, such situation. On the one hand, on the sec second hand, definitely we will proceed with military exercises this year, uh, as soon as we have uh, the decision of uh, the uh, parliament. Uh, maybe we make some modifications, but uh, the, all uh, exercises uh, will take place. So the second point, uh, it's difficult to say uh, to which extent it dissipated. Again, uh, what we hear from the NATO headquarters, and it's on the record, it's not off the record, is that uh, definitely uh, they, I would say, desire to get ready with Ukraine is undiminished. Uh, again, if you refer to this particular situation, we will uh, definitely uh, make uh, sure that the message uh, passes through, and that presumably has been done already. And uh, definitely, the best way to confirm our desire to continue with this would be practical steps in uh, public information, in uh, practical policy decisions, and for that we wait until the government is, uh, start, starts uh, to function. 
And again, I think that uh, it's everything will be done again. I will uh, venture to be a uh, to make a prediction. So since uh, uh, maybe late August, uh, definitely the work uh, will uh, gear up, although it hasn't uh, uh, ceased uh, at any moment. Uh, Sultan Khwaja, World Bank. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ambassador, for uh, the excellent uh, account you had given about the economic performance. I think uh, uh, it's very impressive, and you were very modest in, in, in what you said because uh, I was in Ukraine from, I worked in Ukraine from 1996 to 2000 with Harvard University USA Economic Reform Program. And uh, Ukraine that time had 10 years of continuous GDP decline, uh, one of the largest in, in history for any non-war economy. And to come back from that is a, is a remarkable uh, achievement. And not only that, a lot of uh, institutional uh, structural uh, uh, entanglements, like there were arrears of all kinds, pension arrears, uh, tax arrears, even inter-enterprise arrears, barter economy. And you have disentangled yourself from all that, which is a remarkable achievement. Uh, now, uh, there's one issue you mentioned is, is a priority with the government, and that you mentioned is tax reforms. And this uh, goes across you know, issues of transparency, corruption, there's a huge amount of corruption in the tax administration and in the customs administration, and also for uh, uh, foreign investment point of view. So does the government uh, have any framework on what kind of tax reforms they will have? Thank you. Thank you. Actually, I am not an expert on economics, so I will make, I will quote. Actually, they have coalition agreement with me, and there is a specific issue related to tax reform. So, bear with me for a second. So, tax reform. So, I also I only singled out some, to my mind, the important issue. So, it's. Uh, relates to expanding the base of, tax, uh, base of taxation so to uh, making it more evenly spread, uh, minimizing tax benefits, introducing the real estate tax, introducing the uniform social tax with parallel easing of pressure on the payroll fund, further simplification of accounting procedures, and I think one of the most important parts is adoption of the tax code of Ukraine, something which has been discussed for some time. I also had a chance to speak with the current uh, chairman of the tax administration who was on the visit here in uh, uh, Kiev, so uh, I'm sorry, in Washington. So he thinks that that's really we have come very close to the adoption of the code. At the same time, one thing which is to be done is also to implement all those right decisions in this direction, which have been passed, but somehow uh, a bit, I would say, hovering, so in uh, non-implementation. So I think that it's also important to do even before the tax code is adopted and implemented. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Ambassador. Miles Taylor from the Arms Control Association. Uh, a very large concern to much of the world uh, in the former states of the Soviet Union is arms control, um, stopping weapons proliferation. Um, there have been, as you know, many instances of illegal arms transfers from Ukraine um, in the 1990s. Um, and after an incident a few years ago of an illegal transfer of missiles to China, do you think that Ukraine has the problem under control and that export controls are strong enough? Uh, well, actually, uh, again, to be uh, correct, I would say that, um, so first of all, uh, there were actual cases and they were allegations. Uh, all of the actual cases were investigated, uh, or rather have been investigated, and uh, the appropriate actions uh, have been taken. But, of course, it shows again that uh, although we have quite stringent system of expert control, uh, it showed that we should be paying more attention to that. And actually, we are, again, in a very close uh, uh, cooperation uh, context, consultations with American partners, NATO partners in general on those issues, trying to make sure that uh, uh, that situation would be, uh, any instances would be prevented in future. Although, I, let us be quite frank, 
uh, we have those things popping up in different countries in different parts of the world, so it's really very difficult uh, to track it down uh, unless the government is involved. And in our case, all those cases were, so to say, the manifestations of the private initiative, which definitely should be uh, followed, persecuted, and uh, perpetrated, brought to justice. But uh, many we are aware of uh, some loopholes, uh, and we are working on that to make sure that it doesn't happen in the future. So we are a responsible uh, member of the international uh, arms market. Well, actually, it's a good question. I presume it will take uh, some time to answer. Uh, well, I would say, uh, if I understand uh, correctly what you mean, so definitely, uh, we have now uh, a reemergence or emergence of new lines of tension or some uh, older lines of tension between countries, regions are manifesting themselves in a new form. That's, I would agree, but if you speak about the Cold War in its uh, usual understandable and understood perception, so in this context, I think it's uh, really over. Uh, one of the reasons uh, the balance of powers changed, the uh, nature of uh, powers changed, uh, so many uh, factors involved, but again, uh, I'm afraid if I try to uh, how to put it, to be imagined in the one spot, it will take a bit uh, much time, but it's actually it's an interesting question. Thank you. Okay, well, I think... Uh, <laughs> I mean, I, I'm sorry, but you must have known NATO is going to be, you know, a recurring issue. Um, a related question is, um, I would argue part of the reason why NATO has a bad uh, image in not just the Ukrainian public, but in many publics in the post-Soviet space, um, is because of, for good or ill, um, NATO's role in Kosovo and in the Balkans. And with the question of uh, independence or future status for Kosovo still on an issue that will arise, um, how do you how do you think where where do you see Ukrainian official policy moving on the question of independence and sovereignty um, and how, what is the right balance and how can and how do you see that playing out um, in this larger issue of Ukraine's future in the transatlantic alliance possibly or also its direction towards the European Union? Uh, well, I think it's another well important uh, question, not easy to answer, but uh, being quite frank, I won't say that it was uh, the Kosovo campaign, because over there uh, the stakes were more obvious and the reasons. It was the earlier campaign of bombardment of uh, Belgrade uh, and uh, other targets in Serbia, and one of the reasons was uh, that on the part of the NATO, again, it's my personal capacity, it's also uh, the message wasn't uh, well formulated and well sent. Mm -hmm. When it became clear what were the reasons, so it has become, I would say, uh, clearer for the public as well, but at the first stage definitely it helped uh, our opponents, I mean NATO opponents, to shift uh, the uh, public opinion. Uh, and also our position, uh, just I can, can't go here in detail, but I would say that our position is that any solution should be extremely balanced because we should avoid the situation when we can easily tip uh, the balance in the region with independence of Kosovo and also uh, create a possibility for those who would like to, uh, I would say, uh, stimulate separatist ideas and actions to allude to the Kosovo as a sort of uh, example and pretext. And I was quite open with uh, uh, our colleagues who are in favor of that, although there are some things which we would be willing to discuss and to work out uh, the common approach, but it's quite clear simply saying that it is not an example uh, wouldn't work because those who would like to uh, use it as an example as a reference point will be trying to do that. So it's a challenge for all of us to 
definitely uh, we cannot face the interminable situation like the present one. Uh, we should be working on the solution. But again, when working on the solution, we should definitely keep in mind not only uh, the consequences for uh, the Kosovo itself, uh, but for Kosovo it's also still something what should be discussed in detail, but also in the regional and maybe even larger than the regional uh, impact. Okay, well, on that note, I think we'll bring today's discussion to a close. Uh, uh, let me ask you all to uh, join me in thanking the ambassador for uh, a very broad discussion and also uh, to join me in, in wishing uh, Ukraine good luck in tomorrow's match. <laughs>